reading is from Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the righteous ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Our Psalm, Psalm 145 is the Psalm of David. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another, they tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, he has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall down and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. And our New Testament lesson is from Romans 7, 15 through 25. It's a little involved, so if you got the handout for the message, it's at the beginning. Because sometimes it's hard, it has a lot of do's and nots, and it's a uh, easy to get lost. Where, where are we? I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? 
Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Quite interesting, isn't it, to think about Paul uh, writing those words, one of the most devoted of all disciples, talking how much he struggled, how much he suffered uh, for the sake of the gospel. And even Paul was subject to those kinds of temptations. Well, the message for today uh, is entitled The Pursuit of Happiness, What Makes Us Happy. Now, you might wonder, pursuit of happiness, isn't that from the Declaration of Independence? Wasn't that last week? You know, like July 4th was last Tuesday. Rich, you're really behind the eight ball here. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that, um, it was suggested by the scripture, the lectionary scripture for today, that holidays aren't celebrated quite enough. Uh, think of Christmas. What have we managed to do? We, we, we anticipate it and have all kinds of things happening before. And by the end of Christmas Day, even little kids, it's like, oh, it's over. I've opened all the packages. And tomorrow, whew, it's gone. Whereas in some cultures, what? It's just the beginning. And for the next 12 days, they'll be celebrating Christmas. I kind of like that idea. And so I'm going to apply it to the 4th of July, too, if you don't mind, just for today. And um, I'm going to start not with the scripture, but end with the scripture. And um, on the 4th of July, it's common for us to, to think about what's in the Declaration of Independence. And especially the, the portion of the uh, second paragraph, not the first one. The first one begins with when in the course of human events uh, and sets forth what the Declaration is addressing. But then it begins, you probably could say it with me. If you want to, you can. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, that they are endowed by their with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the... And this is where some people don't know the rest. <laughs> and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, in the 247 years since the issuance of the Declaration, it has become certainly the best known, most often quoted statement of purpose of what government in the United States is. It has become better known even among US citizens than the Constitution. We probably could start the Constitution with we the and then pretty soon the preamble, maybe we learned it long ago, it start to fade away, and the rest of it, who knows what it says, right? Um, and what's interesting, of course, is the Constitution really has a much greater force of law behind it. The Declaration is a marvelous expression of why we want sought our independence and all the reasons for it. And it's a long list of reasons. <laughs> it is a long list of reasons. Um, but the Constitution is what really governs us day by day. But I think the Declaration holds a really important place, though, because it helps provide us with a sense of purpose. And that's really even more important, isn't it, than all the mechanical parts of the Constitution, although they're not unimportant. Um, the Declaration has a global impact far, far beyond the shores of the United States. Uh, it is just, just immense. Uh, that is, it's a succinct and memorable statement of the ideals upon which a nation may be founded. It was the first Declaration of Independence in world history. That's a long time to get to 1776, isn't it? And then to start. It became the foundation for countless independence movements in the world. Over half of the 192 countries in the United Nations have a founding document that could be called a Declaration of Independence. Well, that's all very good. But sadly, the global history of the Declaration of Independence is a story of the spread of sovereignty. That is the idea that each 
nation could be its own state and government and not be controlled by some colonial power or somebody from outside. But it hasn't had quite as good an effect on the idea worldwide of the reception of the idea of individual rights that we hold it so dear for. Uh, we know that, that nations still fight for independence and we think about what's going on in, in uh, Ukraine right now, I think that, that uh, brings it close to, close to our mind. The second point I wanted to make today is as we think about the Declaration, it would be easy to think of it alone as the foundation of, uh, of our society and our being. But I, I want us to think for a moment, it's the second point on the outline, about what is the source of freedom for the individual. In the Declaration, we know it says in the phrase that uh, endowed by their creator, that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Creator with a capital C, not a small c. Uh, this is a concept uh, in political science that they call natural law. And um, natural law is an idea has been around since, uh, given great force, at least since the early 1600s. Um, it is, um, I'll describe it this way. God gave humans reason by which they are to learn of what the natural law is. It's considered that the natural law is there. The Declaration assumes that, doesn't it? It just says that, it, that it, it's previously existed. It wasn't created by the Declaration. Um, and that God also provides revelation concerning his will and his wishes. And in the scriptures, there are given passages dealing with human matters and they're interpreted to be given as a guide for the moral life. Um, a little over a year ago, Judy and I were in Washington, D.C., and I hadn't been there for a long time. And it was nice, it was just the two of us, and there weren't a lot of people, really. It was still kind of post-COVID, almost kind of post-COVID. And uh, I got to go to um, the Library of Congress, which is a really beautiful, beautiful building. And in one of the display areas, there was something, uh, I wouldn't, but I, I, was, I just wanted so badly to reach right, right into the case you know, that was covering what was there. And it wasn't a, a fancy display or a, something of great value to anybody else. But there was a display there, uh, what J Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration, what his library would, would be in it. And what they had done, they had some of his real volumes there some that burned when the Capitol burned in the War of 1812 were replaced with a similar book. And a few places where the book wasn't extant, they put a box that had the name of the book there. So you had an idea of the scope of what he had. But what I really went to look for, first thing, was his copy of John Locke's second treatise on government. And John Locke, probably more than anybody else, gave voice to this idea of natural law. And so here I was, this case was here, and the book was just the other side, Jefferson's copy of Locke's second treatise. If it had been made of gold, it wouldn't have been as valuable to me as to think that was the book that he opened. That was the book that he read. That was the one he, 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 he drew in with his breath, the values in it and that it appeared in the Declaration. Well, for Christians, I should say one other thing. If you ever hear the word natural, this is just an aside, natural law again. Um, it is probably the, the term that best describes the values the Declaration holds. And it, it, just keep your ears open if you ever hear about natural law again and follow up on it a bit. It was sad, a number of years ago, there was, I won't say who, there was one particular person who had been nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court, and you know, those, those hearings have become pretty brutal the last few decades, sadly. 
Uh, and one of the senators asking uh, the member uh, that, was being, that had been nominated to the Supreme Court um, about his, about how could he possibly believe in these strange ideas of natural law. And you could tell, you can tell once in a while, maybe we've all been there when we don't know what we're talking about. And he didn't. Unfortunately, the, the person being questioned went into nice exposition of just what natural law was and what good company it kept in the Declaration. Well, what's the source of freedom for us as individuals, aside from the Declaration and the Creator? It's, it's for us, it's the revelation of the will and the wishes of God as found through the revelation provided by Scripture, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that is God present with us, and the role that reason plays in challenging uh, to exp explain some of those things. Reason can help us to understand Scripture. As we learn more about how Scripture came about, it's really useful. It helps us understand the world around us. It helps do some, do mar some, do some marvelous things. Uh, certainly, the fact that some of us are even still alive today, we owe to modern medicine, don't we? And that took reason and study and so on to do that. Imperfect as it is, just like the rest of us, right? But has made tremendous differences. Reason can help. But it can never supersede God's revelation and the idea that God is with us to comfort and to guide. And we can never use it to totally substitute human judgment for God's. Well, as Christians, what shall we do with our freedom as individuals? I think two things are worthy to think about here as our focus really more, focuses more strongly on Scripture. One is that we are to use our freedom to discern the will of God. That should be the central purpose of our lives. If we were in North Korea today, we certainly would not be in a gathering like this. If you're known to be a Christian, there's a good chance you'd be in a prison camp or killed. We have this incredible freedom, which we use sometimes very well, but, some, but not often enough to discern the will of God. And how do we do that? Through Scripture. It's a written record of what God has revealed to us. Uh, sometimes it's easy to understand and sometimes a little less clear, isn't it? But that's okay. Jesus, even when he was, was uh, telling parables and stories, sometimes their meaning seemed so very clear, didn't they? And other times they were like a, a story you might read today that has multiple layers of depth to it. And sometimes we only discover those later. Uh, to discern the will of God, we need to, to attend to the Holy Spirit and its presence in our lives. It's the pull that we sometimes feel when we're not sure what we should do or what. When we want to do something, we know we shouldn't. It's the pull tugging at us to not do that. <coughs> How can we... Um, use this freedom as individuals to discern the will of God, we can also use reason to do that. As I mentioned, it helps us to understand Scripture and so on. <coughs> uh, but it's, and as useful as it is, it's, um, it's not everything. And it doesn't uh, answer all the questions that we have in life. Some are beyond the scope of what reason can do. But it is useful, and not just for scientists, um, you know, if you think like logic, you know, we'll talk about logic, there's formal logic people can study. Um, yesterday, I, was, I thought I'd have a nice quiet morning at home, and my son Justin called, and he needed to help um, his neighbor, who was still trying to get a little more wheat out before the rain, you know, and it was going to be coming any time. So he took his truck over there and said, Dad, could you feed the calf that's been sick out in the pasture? And I said, sure, I'll do that. And so I went and did that, but I first had to move part of the electric fence because he fell and had intensely grazed one part, and then you move the fence and move the cattle over to that. And then as I got ready to go get the bottle that had been warming, that I had warming inside for the calf, I looked to the west, 
And you know what this looks like. It was all dark and building, and the rain was coming. It was just a matter of when. And I thought, now I have two choices here. I can forget about the calf and just go home, or I can do something else. So I, I, I did stop and put my phone and um, uh, wallet and so on in the truck so they wouldn't get wet. The rest of me, I thought, it's been wet before and it'll be wet again. Anybody's had critters, you know how this is. And uh, so I went and so I started feeding the calf and it did take most, a good part of the bottle. Uh, but about halfway through, here it came. And within a, a few seconds, I was drenched. Now, I might have assumed that the reason I got drenched was because I was feeding the calf. You know, after this, I fed the calf, then I got soaking wet. So I could assume in the future, anytime I wanted to feed the calf, I would get soaking wet. Does that make sense? No. Why not? Well, that's a, that's a fallacy. Logic and, and reason can help us do it. It's called the, the after this, therefore because of this fallacy. You can have fun with lots of things that way, that this happened and this fought, happened, but uh, there was no connection between them at all. But to help us to understand even simple things like that, well, as we think about, as Christians, what shall we do with our freedom as individuals? You could say, and we probably have all thought this at times, wait, wait. What about me pursuing my happiness? What about my happiness? God deciding all of this is just a little too much. It kind of rankles my individual spirit for him to make such a claim. Well, the Declaration and indeed the Constitution tell us what we may do, you might say. But really, what they really do is they tell us, um, they set forth, especially in the Constitution, what powers we grant government and we keep the rest of them. Now, sometimes if you're in a totalitarian state, what would happen? The idea would be you get what rights the state lets you have a big difference between the two. Sometimes when I hear people talking about public issues, it's almost like, well, the, the government was generous in letting something happen. I'm going, generous my foot. It's about what we let government do in a, in a true democracy with limited powers. Well, the Declaration and the Constitution, as great as they are, they say absolutely nothing about what we should do with a personal level of autonomy and freedom that we have. It's a freedom to do what is good to do or what is bad to do. As Christians, we are to choose the good. It's a moral choice, not a forced choice, because we're free to do either. And it's in that sense that we are truly made in the image of God. Well, what else should we do with this freedom to find, besides discerning the will of God, we should try to follow the will of God. And that's where we come to the scripture for today. And I first find the first verse particularly powerful. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Now, hopefully, we don't do that all the time, right? Hopefully, Christianity has made some real impact that oftentimes we are doing good things. But just about when we get a little confident, then what happens? We find that we fall down, don't we? And we do that which we would not do. There's a, an older commentary that, that tries to describe this a bit. And it's a little, little archaic, but I think kind of powerful words. As we search for why do we continue to do that? Can't we learn better than that? Uh, and this is a, it was a man by the name of Benson. He said, these corrupt passions frequently darken the understanding. I really like that phrase, they darken the understanding of what we have. They mislead the judgment and stupefy the conscience. In consequence whereof the will, strongly impelled by, he calls, criminal desires, in the place of being governed by our higher powers of the mind, wants to govern them herself. Again, it's we want to be God, don't we? The ultimate sin. Well, hopefully as we grow in faith as Christians, 
we're being much more successful in doing what God calls us to do. We should take hope in that, cause for real hope, but we should never rest too easy. God will continue to challenge us in unexpected ways. That is what helps us grow in character and in faith. No, we will never wish these challenges on ourselves, but we know they will come. And in all of this, we see the, what I'll call the dichotomy of Christianity. It's another side of the same coin as from the scripture, that what we want to do does not really make us happy. What we want to do does not really, not in the long term, not in depth, make us happy. And of course, that that we don't want to do often does make us happy. It's so counterintuitive, isn't it? How many have ever, um, I think we've all heard about bucket lists. As we get a little older, we think about, and you can't help but think about it, right? Gee, I, I, well, I'm still life on this side. I'd love to, to do this thing or, or that thing or whatever. And um, that's not bad necessarily. It could be a great thing you want to do. Who knows, maybe you want to go on a special mission trip. Or maybe it's something of, of great beauty or so on. That, that is a, a good thing to do. But we could be really enslaved by it too, couldn't we? I find when I think of some things I wanted to do, I'm almost glad I didn't because by the time I got to where I could have, I don't really want to do it anymore. You know, that I thought, why, why did I really get all that excited about it? that particular thing. So what we want to do doesn't always make us, often doesn't make us really happy. But God gives us human agency and freedom, not just from the declaration, it just recites God's granting of it, that we, in his image we're free to choose between the good and the not. And then the last point. Um, and this is something that, uh, some of this may sound like I'm really dealing with government a little bit. Imagine that. I don't know. Get an old government teacher and they're bound to work to it somehow. Um, but it's interesting to me that in the United States, until about 1955, 56, somewhere in there, um, if you were a pastor in a church, you'd be free to say whatever you, you wanted to say about things political. I don't have any inclination to do that today, but you could you could endorse a candidate, you could talk about a particular issue, and so on that way. Um, but in 1956, um, Lyndon Johnson, who was Senate Majority Leader at the time, got pushed through an amendment to the, uh, the um, acts governing the Internal Revenue Service. And a church, if you actually endorse a candidate or an issue or the like, uh, that you could lose your tax exemption and would have to pay income taxes. Uh, that's kind of an interesting thing when you think about it because um, if you go back in American history, starting with the arrival of the first settlers in the early 1600s, especially New England and then other the colonies and so on, through the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and until well into the last century, uh, pastors often spoke about things political. And... Um, like I say, I'm not tempted to do that today. I'm not complaining about that. But um, it always struck me as a little curious in a free society why that would be so. Why that would be so. Well, our last point. In following the will of God as citizens in a free society, I think we need to also help that society by trying to provide a moral foundation for it to continue. Um, the founders recognized that self-government required virtue. They actually called this Republican virtue, with a small r, not about the political party. Republican virtue. Ben Franklin concisely expressed this view when he insisted that only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they will have more need of masters. Their desire to control all of this well, they'll go to authoritarianism. But at the time of the founding and for most of our history, religious institutions,